Okay. I think or you already spot lie. You already spot put. I think it for me is still. Hello, uh, good morning everyone. So uh, welcome to WAM seminar today. So before we start, uh, may I ask all the participants to turn on their videos? Yeah. See that? Oh, yeah. He is turning on. Hmm. Hello, Grace. Hello, Miss Suchitra. Uh, may I request you to turn on your videos as well? And also, Mr. Divesh. Hello, Mr. Robin. Is it okay to turn on your videos just for a short while? Okay. So good evening. Uh, good morning again, everyone. So welcome again to this WAM seminar. So uh, before we start, uh, first, uh, please remember to mute your microphone uh, in order to annoy, uh, avoid any noises, un uh, unwanted noise. And um, we have Dr. Sangam here who will help us to moderate the question sections later on. So whenever uh, anyone has a question to the presenter, uh, please turn on your video and also unmute yourself. But uh, during the presentation, so may I request to uh, keep, your, keep your microphone muted. Thank you.
Okay, just for confirmation, is everyone uh, have my share screen at WAM seminar PowerPoint? Okay, so uh, we shall begin the very first uh, WAM seminar. And I'm very happy today uh, to be the host for this event. So everyone can call me Dr. Locke. I'm an assistant professor, new faculty member of our water engineering and management family. Uh, before we start, uh, my presentation today will contain the rationale why uh, we initiated this WAM seminar, what are the expectations that uh, we hope that the students uh, will achieve by attending the series of seminar some of the key points that I would like to mention so that the seminar can work smoothly and efficiently. Uh, I would also uh, recommend a presentation structure that the students uh, might refer to for their upcoming presentations. So before we start, since I'm, uh, I'm new, but at the same time on here, so just like briefly uh, go through my profile. So my name is Ho Hulok, Assistant Professor of WEM. So as you see from educational background, I'm also an alumnus of WEM. After graduating from WEM, I did my PhD in Kyoto University. Then I spent three years as postdoc in Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. Uh, for the courses that I will be offering in the upcoming uh, semesters will be hydrodynamics, flood modeling and management, and river engineering. For my research foci, uh, I'm the most interested in nature-based solutions, ecosystem services, statistical methods, and also data analytics. So first we will start with the rationales of the uh, seminar series. So my ultimate goal is to enhance the scholarly exchanges among students, research staff, and also faculty of our WAM family. Um, the thing is, most every student will have their own research, thesis, very different, agricultural, urban, uh, climate change. So I, this, through this WAM seminar, the students will have the chance to really understand what the peers are doing to expand our knowledge. And the second goal of the seminar is to improve the presentation skills. Uh, from the way uh, we see it, presentations, writing is one of the most critical soft skills for both academic and industry. Up, after you graduate from WEM, either you go to work in academics, you go back to work in a government agency, or even you work as a consultant. Presentation is one of the most critical soft skills that we believe that through this seminar, we will help to improve. Uh, the structure of the uh, seminar series, we are trying to have uh, two presentations for each seminar. And the final goal is also to win prizes. So uh, some key points for all the students, the seminar will be held bi-monthly, meaning uh, two seminars per semester, oh, sorry, two seminars per month. And for each presentation, for each seminar, we'll have two presentations. The attendance to this WAM seminar is compulsory. Uh, I will go to the next slide, we'll go through the schedule, which is tentative and uh, subject to changes. So for the tentative schedule, uh, after this seminar, the uh, tentative schedule will be circulated uh, to all of you. Uh, the presenters will have until May 6th to recommend suggest changes to the schedule uh, that will be communicated with me, who will be the faculty in charge of this WAM seminar series. And the final schedule will be announced on May 8th. However, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the order of the presentations are subject to changes as well. So I will also go through like how you can make changes to the uh, schedule of the uh, seminars. So for example, today is 28th. Uh, I have the um, honor <laughs> to start uh, this kickstart, this seminar with introduction and templates. Uh, following up will be Mr. Saurav uh, with his topic on development of framework to assess groundwater governance in rapidly urbanizing cities. So uh, from the list of students, we have arranged uh, the order of the presentations randomly. There's no prioritization here. So um, the only one single criteria criterion for the presenters is we are trying to have a mix between master and doctors. So we are, so that's the only rule for the allocation of the seminars. 
So the topic will be announced. So let's say, for example, uh, next week we will have a presentation from Ms. Pia Monai, or and then followed by Ms. Shakti, and so on and so forth. So for the presenters, you can present basically any topics related to your research. We, re we encourage that you can present your own goal thesis, but it can be also a papers that you find very relevant to your research. You can also present a method that you find very useful for your research as well. The presentation will typically last for 15 to 20, to 20 minutes, followed by five to 10 minutes Q&A section. So this is important point that I would like to emphasize that in case that you want to change your slots after May 8th, when the final schedule has been circulated, you are responsible to make all the necessary arrangements. So what are these necessary arrangements? I will go in the uh, following slide. So before the presentation day, uh, please prepare the following information and send to Kun Kop, Kun Yani. Uh, one day before the presentation. So we need, so you need to inform the topic of your presentation, a short abstract of what are you going to present and also an introduction of your economic background. So this information will be crafted into a flyer as such, where we can have uh, you announce as the presenter some information about yourself, some abs the abstract of the topic you are going to present. So each of the presenter will have one flyer as such uh, announced before the seminars. During the presentation, one student will oversee the time and remind the presenter so that uh, we can keep the time and the uh, uh, seminar effectively. It is highly recommended that students contribute questions and comments for presenters to improve. So again, I would like to revisit the point that each of you are carrying on very different fields of research. However, there are some points that definitely the, these paths can cross. For example, the significance, the applications of the crafted knowledge, the shared methods that maybe some of you can share and learn from each other. So it is highly recommended that students contribute questions for the presenters. Also, uh, for give comments for him or her to improve the presentation skills. Uh, the third point that I would like to raise is it is compulsory to use a WAM virtual background for standardization purpose. So this is a virtual background. So during the presentation, each presenters, please use this virtual background uh, for your Zoom settings, for your video Zoom settings. So the high, the high resolution file of this picture will be also be circulated after today's seminar. So now the most important point, after May 8th, when the tentative schedule has been announced, it is conditionally fixed. So in, a, in an event where you feel you cannot present in a particular day that has been allocated for you, so it is your responsibility to communicate with your friend or your senior, the presenter whose slot you wish to exchange and seek his or her consent. After the consent has been achieved, please communicate with uh, the faculty in charge uh, for this for this semester, the faculty in charge will be myself and could cop of the changes. And please CC the person who has agreed to change the slot with you at least two days before the presentation. The head time two days is because we will have to prepare uh, the announcement and then also uh, prepare the flyer for the presenters. So please be mindful uh, that it is your responsibility to make the necessary arrangements uh, to amend the schedule. However, uh, after today's seminar, I will circulate the tentative uh, schedule. And then based on that, if you feel you're not ready to present, you can always communicate with me and then we can shift accordingly. So the deadline to do the first round of amendments will be 6th of May. And then the final uh, tentative schedule will be announced on the 
May 8th. So please be mindful of these two deadlines. So uh, now I will go to the presentation structure. So uh, it is recommended that each of the presenter please follow uh, this uh, presentation structure in order to facilitate uh, a more convenient and easy follow for each of the for the participants. So uh, we will have basically four uh, parts in any presentation: the introduction, data and methods, results and discussions, and conclusions. Um, when you this will be very useful for you as well when you when you prepare for this one. It will, you can also build up upon this one. Uh, for your thesis or even for your uh, final pre presentation. So for the introduction, the information that uh, we'll be looking at will be the problem statement, uh, the research gap uh, that you are targeting. Uh, be very specific of the objectives, uh, what you want to do uh, with this particular research. Again, I want to emphasize that it does not have to be your own research. It can be a paper that you are very fond of, you feel very relevant, but be specific and list down the specific activities that this particular paper are pursuing. And also mention these two key points that I keep uh, on mentioning is the novelty and the significance of the research itself. Again, it can also be a method, but what is a method novelty? How can it, what is the advantages? from this method over others that should be mentioned in introduction part of the presentations. For data and method, um, depends on uh, the nature of your research, but does the map of the study area should be there. Uh, data collection method, uh, what sources of data are you going to collect? Is it meteorological data? Is it hydrological data? Are you going to conduct surveys? So all of those must be made as explicit as possible. And then after you collected the data, what kind of analytical approaches that are you going to use? Uh, also need to make uh, very clear with references. For the results in discussions, it can be, this is a little bit uh, more flexible. So it depends on the nature of the research conducted. It can be immediate results that, for example, some descriptive statistics, uh, from the questionnaire that you collected, some descriptive statistics for the water quality or the hydrological data that you collected. Inferential speculations here, you can go a little bit deeper on what kind of conclusions, what kind of inferences that you can draw from the in immediate results. Implications, so here you link back to your uh, novelty and then also objectives, how the results were able to help you uh, to answer these research questions or achieve the uh, objectives. Then recommendations, let's say, is there any methodological implications that you want to highlight that you think it can be improved? So this also go into the result and discussion section. Uh, then finally, conclusions, uh, please reiterate the research question and how you have answered them with the, the result. Is it answered 100% or there are some gaps that, you, that can stimulate a future research it? as future outlooks. So uh, do you have any uh, questions related to uh, how this WEM seminars is going to be organized and also the structure of the presentations? Uh, for those who want to uh, raise questions, please unmute and also keep your videos on. Is there any questions? Any questions related to this seminar? Maybe Dr. Tun, you can start first. You have any suggestion or question to the seminars? 
Oh, thank you for uh, your like a uh, very quickly and very like uh, detail about the uh, structure of the seminar. So I think every information is clear, so students can follow and any presenter can follow the the guideline, even the detail of the format of presentation. So I think it's good enough information for a student and uh, any presenter want to join the, the seminar of WEM. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ton. So I want to ask Mr. Rabin, uh, so you have already uh, had your progress. And then also I was also there during the uh, uh, your presentation. So you have any questions related to this activity? Um, uh, congratulations uh, to the WEM team for launching this uh, seminar. Uh, uh, so, so I'm happy to be part of this uh, seminar. Uh, and uh, the, the overall structure of the uh, seminar looks good to me. Uh, and then the, the one thing I, I, I want to make it clear and I ask you that uh, what type of you know the researches uh, that we can present so that will be related to water but uh, the what uh, domain it covers the scope uh, to the extent what we have to go we can go so that uh, that might be useful for all of us I think so uh, thank you Mr. Robin uh, Robin for your question. So I'd like to respond as follows. Um, here we are WEM. And as you can see from the uh, virtual background, let's talk about water. But uh, your suggestion is very relevant. And I already mentioned in the very beginning of the seminar that you can also present uh, analytical method. It does not have to be directly related to um, water. I can give an example. For example, a multivariate analysis, it emerged from shorter science. However, it has been applied extensively in uh, water research as well, especially water quality. So you can also introduce, for those who are not familiar with that particular method, uh, that also be a very good topic to present. So it does not have to be directly related to water. So you can present some analytical method that you find will be useful, that you found useful for your research. And then also you may think that it is useful for your peers as well. Does it answer your question, Mr. Rabin? Thank you. Yeah. Do we have uh, Do we have any questions from the master students uh, who are, who is going to have the uh, their defense very soon? Um, hello, Miss Grace. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, are you you are going to have your defense soon, right? Yes. So, uh, you have any uh, question related to uh, this gram seminar? Actually, I think this can be a good rehearsal for for your final defense as well. Yes, it's a good rehearsal, I think, and it's a good way of learning from your from people you know, so you can ask comfortably and learn more. I think I have no question, sir. Okay. Uh, how about Mr. Tondon? We have any uh, suggestion comments for this activity that we are launching? Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, we can uh, hear you. Sorry, I'm uh, sorry. I just come in, so I don't know how about the, the, the presentation. I have no any questions. So sorry. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, how about Koso? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful organizing the seminar, sir. So I think most of the things are quite clear. So from my side, there's no any questions. Okay, so if uh, no one has questions, I'm surprised because I mentioned the rationales of the questionnaires, uh, sorry, the, the rationale of this include winning prizes, but no one asked about prizes, so I will introduce it myself then. <laughs> so, uh, okay, because I intentionally hide it. So, okay, so here are the prizes. Once after five seminars, the best presentation by voting will win a duo drink. I put it in the rationales. That to win prize is not about academics, but no one answer about it. Okay, so uh, here's the deal. Uh, after five seminars, then we will have 10, uh, 10 presentations, right? So we will have a sizable sample. So uh, the, win the winners will have a duo drink. It means you, will, you can invite one of your friend, partner, to either internin or homegrown for a drink to celebrate this prize. No one asked, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so uh, if that is the case, then uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Sorov. I think a lot of us have already known him, so uh, okay. So, is it? No, I think stop share. Yes? Uh. Uh, uh, I think, uh, as far as I understand, there will be two presentation uh, within one seminar. Yeah. So the time slot we have selected is like one hour. It means like one presenter gets uh, about half an hour to present his materials. So is this time uh, flexible or like it is quite rigid? Uh, we need to finish. Maybe sometimes there will be so many questionnaire sections. So. Uh, we need to extend the time period for one presenter to 45 minutes or 40 minutes. Yeah. So uh, are, are we uh, flexible in this time slot or not? Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Suwash, for, for raising a very uh, critical issue. Actually, I uh, the way I envision it is uh, we will have one of the students or even myself to keep the time um, we, we should be flexible, but at the same time, we need to keep the time uh, because the target is 15 to 20 minutes, which resemble uh, their final defense as well. So it cannot be so too draggy. And, so the, and then also, this is also a good practice so that for the upcoming the experience in real life, so they need to learn how to keep, keep with the time for the presentation. So I would say uh, two, three minutes, should be uh, tolerable, but uh, not more than 10, we say. 30, yes, total question will be 30. Yeah, preferably 15 to 20 minutes, and then five to 10 minutes for Q&A. Okay, Okay, so uh, next up, uh, I would like to introduce and invite Mr. Saurav, uh, Casey, uh, to take the stage. And then uh, Mr. Saurav is a PhD candidate. I, I believe that most of you have been quite familiar with him. So his research interest includes groundwater governance, climate change, urban flooding, and disaster risk management. Uh, he is currently involved as a early career researcher at uh, SEI as well. So Mr. Saurav is going to share with us uh, his research on development of framework to assess the groundwater governance in rapidly urbanizing cities. So uh, thank you, Mrs. Oro.
thank you dr lok uh, i would like to welcome all the participants uh, in this swim seminar uh, via zoom and uh, facebook live also yeah yeah uh, first of all i would like to thank professor sangam shrestha dr lok and wm team for organizing this seminar and creating uh, this platform for students to share their uh, research works uh, their ideas and uh, Uh, over this platform and uh, also to develop the communication skills among each other uh, i am saurabh kc phd candidate at uh, oim ait and uh, today um, i would like to present uh, a part of my phd research which is the development of framework to assess groundwater governance um, in rapidly urbanizing cities so i think everyone can see my screen here so this is uh, this is the structure of uh, today's presentation uh, i'll just skip it uh, whenever we talk about governance uh, it's a general term it's a very a vague term and uh, the definitions we can find for governance could be different different in terms of organizations different in terms of context uh, on which we are defining the governance but whatever be the definitions or whatever whoever be the organizations or whoever be the persons defining governance uh, they have to give three mutual elements um, in this uh, definition that is the process the power or the authority and the collective management of the community aquifer so in simple uh, we can define governance as a process of exercising authorized power uh, in handling or managing the community affairs so since the presentation is more about uh, the urbanizing area or the cities so i would like to discuss uh, partly on the urbanization trend uh, that the united nation projects for 2050 which shows that 68% of the global population will be residing on the cities and uh, it makes it sure that the cities will be highly stressed in terms of its service delivery and one of the service delivery is water water and sanitation service delivery included with uh, employment education health and other things so since we are talking about water sector here so in urban area if we are talking about the governance of the water we are talking about the urban water governance and this would be a key to move this crisis to risk management strategy uh, to uh, overcome this challenge so when we talk about water governance uh, it could be on the city it could be surface water governance or it could be uh, ground water governance so uh, here we are focusing on ground water governance from the uh, world's uh, water uh, distribution you can see that out of 2.5% of fresh water available only 30% is the ground water and 0.4% is the surface water and the rest of them are glaciers and permafrost so you can see that uh, the ground water is evidently available so uh, it's one of the common pool resource uh, where everyone and every sector or every individuals are using and uh, due to which there are multiple stresses on this ground water so due to rapid population growth and urbanization the ground water is being stressed the other stresses can be climate change um, industrial development tourism development and also um, effect of one country uh, is affecting the other country so there is transboundary effects also so due to these multiple stresses on this common pool resource there are many management issues that are um, uh, growing every day so it could be uh, the um, uh, water level changes it could be the uh, land subsidence due to these changes it could be the um, uh, contaminant transfers or it could be the different types of conflicts uh, for Uh, water use or water um, access or something like this so groundwater is one of the important source uh, for every sectors in the world and uh, we can see the trends that uh, groundwater is uh, being rapidly used uh, we can see that it is nearly four times in last 50 years by one study done by fao so governing and managing this uh, groundwater resource is very important but uh, this has been repeatedly been ignored and underrated uh because uh, it's abundant uh, availability but uh, it should be recharged um, and it should be managed properly so that we can our future generation can also use it so understanding groundwater governance could be one of the soft approach for managing and addressing these challenges so in short uh, if we define groundwater governance from different definitions or something it's just a uh, collective action it's a collective action of inclusive uh, planning and decision making Uh, by all the uh, stakeholders involved in it through adequate and reliable data and information and which will ultimately uh, help in sustainable development and uh, utilization of this resource and uh, which will finally support in the water security there could be many conditions for good water go groundwater governance 
and it may depend upon the context or it may depend upon uh, the what criteria we want but the general conditions uh, for good groundwater governance is political commitment and leadership so the stakeholder involvement should be there and knowledge and awareness should be there so in this study um, uh, we are developing a framework through some guiding principle and enabling framework so that um, we can assess uh, the current state of groundwater governance that we are trying to uh, get a quantitative value for a qualitative term that I'm talking, this groundwater governance is a qualitative term and we are trying to get a quantitative value so that it, it would help in uh, further on groundwater management and which will ultimately support in the water security. So this framework will assist in uh, to take the stock of uh, the current state of groundwater governance in terms of actors, in terms of regulatory frameworks, in terms of policies, informations and other um, uh, other uh, strengths and uh, um, gaps or opportunities or areas improvement that we have to do. This will facilitate governor, go government planners or managers and related actors in informed decision making and initiate an urgent call for action for sustainable groundwater development and management. The overall objective of this study is uh, to develop the framework uh, so that we can assess groundwater governance or current state of groundwater governance and this overall objective has been divided into two objectives. One is to review the different uh, components of groundwater governance first that should be embedded on the framework. And second is to apply that review um, by developing the framework that can evaluate the current state of groundwater governance in these rapidly urbanizing cities. So these are the uh, different materials that I have used to uh, develop uh, this framework. So there are many multinational um, uh, institutes reports uh, that has been followed and that has been used in the multiple research application. So this has been followed to develop this framework to first to review and then to develop the framework. So this can be seen from this overall methodology framework. So we can see here the first objective is uh, to review the groundwater governance and to understand what are the different components that we have to uh, think uh, or take in mind before uh, developing this uh, uh, framework. What are uh, the things that we have to include for make it to make it more inclusive framework and uh, to analyze this framework and then we develop the framework. First, we selected some indicators and then dimensions, and then we described these indicators in details. And uh, then we finally aggregated um, or developed an aggregation equation for this, uh, for this index so that we, get, we could get a quantitative value um, at the last. Okay. So can you see my pointer? Yeah. So on the results and discussion, as we discussed, the first part was to uh, have a uh, comprehensive literature review so that we can understand what would be the components of groundwater governance. So from the study, we found that there are four major components of groundwater governance. One is actor. The second is the legal frameworks. The third is the information and knowledge. And the fourth is the you know, policies and plan. So for to assess the groundwater governance, there should be involvement of actors. There should be multi-stakeholder actors or multi-stakeholder engagement and participation. There should be some favorable legal and institutional framework. There should be precisely and accurate or uh, relevant uh, information and knowledge on this. And there should be some policies that an incentive that are structured towards the goal. So to assess the groundwater governance or to diagnose the groundwater governance of any area or any city, uh, should be done on these four components. That is, this, what are the strengths of this uh, component and what are the weakness of this component? So whatever are the weakness, or I, I would like to say what are, whatever are the areas for improvement, so we can improve those areas so that overall the groundwater governance of the uh, area is increased. So I'll uh, describe every uh, individual components uh, one to one. So the first one is the actors. So good governance requires active participation of different actors. This actor can be uh, different. It can be different on different sector, uh, but generally the actors are everyone. It can be politicians who influence the decisions or who take the decision. It can be the government decision makers, government agencies. It can be the academicians, it can be planners. It can be the groundwater users also. It can be the private sector. It can be community-based organization, NGOs and CBOs or international organizations. So these all actors should be taken in concern while uh, looking at the groundwater governance and also these things should be taken in um, consideration while developing this framework. So whenever we are um, uh, diagnosing this uh, factor or this component, 
uh, of groundwater governance, these uh, involvement and roles should be of these actors should be understood. Uh, 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 we should also understand what is the sense of urgency of these uh, actors uh, regarding groundwater governance and management. Uh, yeah, are they are there clear mandate um, and capacity among the in charge groundwater governance agencies? Are they motivated to work on this groundwater? So uh, are the um, uh, stakeholder capable enough? Are uh, for the effective participation and what is the state of current cooperation partnership and what are the different conflicts among these multiple actors should be understood. The second is um, the legal frameworks. These are the legally binding norms, so uh, which uh, clearly delineates the roles and responsibility of all individual actors. So uh, to understand this component, uh, um, or if we have a legal framework, then this should be uh, well defined. So based on its definition or how, how well it is defined on its function, we can um, uh, look on this component. So what is the capacity of the uh, go governing institution or governing in charge institution to monitor and enforce uh, this um, um, uh, legal framework? And uh, does it harmonize uh, uh, or not? Means like there are many uh, transboundary aquifers. It can be local transboundary aquifer uh, within a country or it can be international transboundary aquifer. So, this harmonization should be maintained by uh, these uh, legally binding um, uh, documents or frameworks. The third component is um, policies. So these are the decisions uh, oriented um, towards a long-term purpose. So it can be different. The policies can be different. Uh, it can be uh, economic policies or incentives. It can be uh, incentives also. And uh, looking at the policies, we can also say what is the stage of groundwater management in that um, uh, place. For example, uh, if some place have a proactive mode, uh, I'm going on the third one, uh, proactive mode, they have integrated water resource management plan, they have a comprehensive groundwater water policy, then we can directly say that uh, the groundwater management stage of this area is on <clears throat> advanced management stage. But if some are still on responsive mode, so they are only looking about uh, for the uh, groundwater as the water supply and sanitation proposed. So the policies are oriented toward the response mode. Then we can say these areas are mainly on pre-management stage. So these management stage also define the governance as management, uh, what, whatever are in the stage of the management. This defines what is the stage of uh, groundwater governance of that area. The last but not the least is the information and knowledge. So to have a proper or good groundwater governance, there should be adequate and reliable information. So information in, includes both the static information and the dynamic information and the regular monitoring of this information. So having information is only not important. So it should be converted into knowledge so that uh, uh, decision makers can have an informed decision making through this knowledge or through this information. And once uh, that decision making are, are made, so these results uh, and information uh, should be shared among, or there should be some mechanism to be shared among widely um, stake wide stakeholders. Uh, these all four components and uh, whatever uh, we, we are taking concern on these, these components are included in the uh, framework that we are uh, we are talking on the next slide. Uh, before this, uh, I we also reviewed uh, so which of the stakeholders are being represented or being studied on uh, in water sector. So if you can see that um, uh, the green one is the traditional stakeholders. So many of the water sector studies, they have used um, academics, governments, uh, media, or agriculture actors. So whenever we are talking about the water, so these uh, these stakeholders are being um, regularly represented. And now in modern trends, uh, we are also including uh, the long-term investors. We are including the companies, private companies, or, or the chain uh, who, who are in the water footprint. And um, uh, for urban area, we are, we are also choosing the spatial planning or develop. So these sectors are also being, or these uh, actors are also being included in the water sector, but still uh, there are missing um, uh, stakeholders. They are the women, the poor, or the indigenous community for whom uh, water is equally important like others. So these are uh, in, uh, repeatedly being ignored or, uh, or not represented in uh, many of the water sector studies. So this framework also tries to include um, uh, these unrepresented stakeholders. So whenever you see on the framework, this vulnerable, vulnerable and marginalized uh, groups or BNM. So these, uh, these are represented, these are those indicators or those dimensions are, uh, represents these unrepresented stakeholders. So now I'm going for the objective two, which is uh, the structure of the framework. So you can see that uh, the structure of framework is, um, uh, uh, is divided into different dimensions, different indicators, 
and uh, different variables. So there are four dimensions on uh, on this current structure, uh, which has been uh, divided or uh, which, which have nearly 30 indicators. And each indicators have two variables. Aggregating this whole structure will give one index value, which is known as groundwater governance index. So the four technical dim four dimensions are the technical dimension, the legal and institutional dimension, the cross-sector policy coordination, and the operation. This one is the dimension. The earlier we talked about the components. This dimension will uh, incorporate the four components of groundwater governance that we should look. I, I will also uh, mark this point at the last of the presentation. So these four dimensions will have 30 indicators, uh, which have been selected from different uh, international organizations, reports, and study. Uh, and uh, every indicator will, will be measured on two variables. One is adequacy of existing governance provision, and the next is institutional capacity for its implementation. So these two variables will be rated between zero and three, where zero will be non-existent state of uh, non-existent, and three is the optimum. So if, if there is non-existent of uh, so, so for some indicator, the adequacy of provision is not existent, then we can rate it zero. If it is acceptable, we can rate it two, uh, and uh, same applies to the institutional capacity also. So this is the overall um, uh, framework for the groundwater governance. You can see the dimension, you can see the 30 indicators, and every indicator will be measured uh, within these two variables, adequacy of provision and institutional capacity. So the first indicator, uh, first dimension is the technical dimension, which have uh, seven indicators. So technical dimension is more relevant to information and knowledge component of groundwater governance. So we can see here the informations like hydrogeological maps, groundwater, Aquifer is gelinated or not? What is the capacity if it is gelinated? So in this way, this indicator will be assessed. So as I said, these uh, unrepresented sectors are represented here as B and M groups um, uh, in the uh, framework. The second dimension is the legal and institutional dimension, which is one of the most important dimension in uh, groundwater governance. This dimension consists of 14 indicators. So these indicators are generally, uh, are there any permits available or not? Or what is the capacity to implement that permits? So what are, uh, is there any sanction for illegal water well construction? Or there is levies or not? Who is the main groundwater uh, resource in Tarzan? Um, uh, and um, what about VNM groups? What about inclusiveness? What about the customary rights for indigenous groups? These things are mentioned on uh, legal and institutional aspect. The third dimension is the cross-sector policy coordination. We have taken three, um, uh, sectors here, agriculture, urban area or industrial sector, and the tourism sector. So these are mentioned in the indicators. Uh, and the, fifth, the fourth one is the um, operational uh, dimension where we have five different operational uh, level indicators. Each of these indicators uh, in detailed framework has been defined clearly what is this, what this indicator speaks about and what we want to really find out from this indicator. So I could not show this on the presentation, but is 30 indicators uh, has been defined clearly uh, in the detail um, framework. So we have a lot of indicator and we have four dimension over here. So uh, one uh, idea could be uh, we go for equal wages. Uh, so since we are developing uh, a framework for now, so during application, we can go for equal wages for every variable. We can go for equal wages for every indicators and dimension, or we can use uh, some uh, multi criteria decision making um, uh, tool like ESP uh, to identify um, what would be uh, the weightage of the dimension or indicators. For now, uh, for when we are piloting this uh, uh, framework, we, we plan to uh, take an expert opinion for uh, the weightage of the dimension and uh, ASP shall be used. So finally, uh, how we aggregate uh, this all information into one value. So this is, this is a framework. For example, in indicator two, we can see there are two, in every indicator, there are two variables. So first we have to get the value of the indicator. We use the equation. So if we have weighted and we have the value of the variables, uh, then we can directly get the um, uh, uh, value of this each indicator by using this equation. Once all 30 indicators value we, we get, we use this equation for uh, to get the um, uh, value or aggregated value of the dimension. So finally this, 30 values or 60 values will be converted into 30. The 30 values will be converted into four. And once these four value we, uh, we achieve and uh, with the appropriate weightage or equal weightage, uh, we get uh, the final GGI value, which is known as groundwater governance index. Once we get this value, these values will be between zero to three. So zero will represent the non-existent state of governance and um, 0 0.1 to one will be incipient. Similarly, acceptable state of governance and optimum state of governance. 
this value will definitely come between zero and three. As if you remember the rating, it was between zero and three. So it will definitely come in between this. So we have described the every state of governance. So if it is a non-existent state of governance, so it is non-existent state in, in terms of dimensional perspective, the four dimension we have considered. And um, uh, there is either no to highly sufficient provision or uh, uh, highly insufficient provision for these uh, regulatory frameworks and other provisions. So this area will face several issues and conflict and uh, because there is lack of institutional capacity on this. Similarly, every of the state of government or every of the threshold has been defined uh, based on their state, based on their provision, based on their uh, how, what issues or uh, conflict they will uh, face and what is the basic issue or capacity of them. So I have created a sample of this uh, framework. If we apply this framework, for example, we get a GGI value of 1.3. So from the threshold, we can directly know our, our decision maker or an uh, unknown person who just uh, is, have, do not have the idea of the groundwater governance, they can directly know, uh, okay, the groundwater governance is on acceptable state. So for uh, for basic understanding, it's an acceptable state of groundwater governance. So when we go on dimension point, so uh, if it's uh, equal weightage, you can see that there are four dimensions have their own values, which will give uh, 1.73. So we can see that the technical and legal dimension are very good on this area, for this sample area, uh, and uh, they are on the optimum state. But if you can see the cross-sectoral policy coordination uh, is uh, still on the incipient stage, though the groundwater governance index is on acceptable state. So one, we can uh, see as a whole. Second, we can see as a uh, dimension uh, point of view. So within dimension also, we, can, we have different indicators. Okay, on cross-sectoral policy coordination, it's only 0 0.7, which is on incipient stage. So we can see that uh, in the four different indicators of the cross-sectoral policy coordination, the the red one or the orange one is the institutional capacity. Though in this area, the institutional cap or cross sector policy coordination is uh, is not good, but there are uh, uh, though uh, the institutional capacity is or adequate there or uh, or or more than uh, required there. But the provision is still uh, not there. So so we can we can recommend that this provision should be made because the people are available or capacity for the institution is available to implement this provision. But the problem is the provision is not there. And within that also, uh, this area or the sample area do not have any provision for the coordination with the museum development. Similarly, if we see the technical components is 2.16. So anyone from the, uh, from the threshold can see it's on the optimum state. But if we see it on the, from the dimensional perspective, uh, and, uh, and if you see one of the indicator, Though the overall dimension is on optimum state, one of the indicator is still on the uh, very poor state or non-existent state. Like uh, there, I, even though there is uh, uh, institutional capacity to uh, have some publications related to VNM group or information sharing among them, but there is no provision of the government to share this type of information. So these uh, things can be looked for looking at the short-term planning for the mid-term planning and the long-term planning, how this governance, uh, current state of governance can be improved uh, step by step on the selected area. Not only from this part of this, uh, we can uh, analyze this framework, um, uh, use this framework, to analyzing on different components of the framework. So we said here that this, these are the four components uh, or four dimensions of the framework. And the and the when we are, whenever we are looking on the groundwater governance, we have to look on these four components. So if you see the indicators on technical dimension, they are more relevant to uh, giving the information about uh, information and knowledge component. Similarly, if you see uh, the legal and institutional dimension, they will give more or they are more relevant to legal frameworks um, component of the groundwater governance. This framework can also be used to look on different variable aspects or different parameters. Like if you want to see the governance of groundwater extraction, you can follow a few indicators mentioned here. Uh, also, we can look on the quality or related indicators only, or we can look on both quality and um, extraction related indicators. Or if you want to look how inclusive is the uh, uh, groundwater governance in that area, we can look on the vulnerable and managed marginalized related indicators. Furthermore, so this uh, framework can also be modified based on what uh, stage we are. So the indicators can be modified and the dimension remains will be same. And in this way, we can uh, use this uh, framework to analyze different perspective. So I come to my second last slide. So uh, I conclude the presentation into uh, from the review. We found that there are four major components of groundwater governance. They are the actors, the legal frameworks, the policies and plans, and the information and knowledge. The framework that we developed for evaluating the groundwater governance in rapidly urbanized cities 
uh, includes four different dimensions, 30 indicators, and two variables to measure each indicator. And finally, the framework will give a GGI value known as groundwater governance index value or quantitative value that ranges from zero to three, where zero represents the non-existent state and three represents the optimal state of governance. I'd also like to thank uh, the JIRA project uh, on which I'm involved. Uh, my advisor, Professor Sangam Sestra, who has been uh, uh, supporting me uh, to develop this framework and the entire team of the project and my examination committee members. Uh, and thank you for listening to me. If you have any question, uh, please uh, 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 give your question, comments uh, to improve this framework. Thank you. Uh, okay, so first, thank you, Mr. Sorov, for giving a very informative uh, presentation. Actually, a lot of information to, to digest in such a short presentation. So uh, in order to uh, simulate the uh, uh, Q&A, uh, may I ask, uh, who are the students that are working directly in groundwater issues for the thesis? Uh, maybe you can use the raise hand function. Who's working directly on groundwater? Um, those working on the uh, ground one, okay, Grace. The, 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 the race hand. Okay, apart from Grace, any other one working in ground water? Sanjeev is on so. Okay, so only two. Okay, so maybe uh, Grace already asked, so maybe I can, yeah, Sanjeev, are you there, Sanjeev? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, so uh, okay, so since you're also working in uh, crowd water, uh, can you ask questions related to how do you think like this one uh, will be useful for your research or something? Yeah, please, please ask questions. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Saurabh Dai, for such a comprehensive presentation. So I believe that uh, the outcomes of this uh, research will be very helpful for uh, assessing the groundwater governance in uh, rapidly urbanizing cities. So I have a few queries. So like, uh, is this uh, framework is uh, applicable uh, throughout the globe or only particular cities? This is my first question. And the second one is, uh, can you please, uh, yeah, it's on slide 20. So here are several indicators. So, uh, so how are you planning to uh, achieve the uh, value of these indicators? Like, uh, are you doing some questionnaire survey or uh, you are like getting this value by doing some literature review. So, so if uh, you are doing questionnaire survey also, so you may get several values of these two variables, right? So, uh, how will you change these several values into one value? Uh, value uh, like whether you will do average or what have you planned for this? I have these two questions. Okay, so uh, let me repeat the questions uh, for everyone. So the first question that Sanjeev have for Sora is, uh, do you think that your proposed framework can uh, apply to different contexts because of the, the, the title is of rapidly urbanizing cities, but do you think that it can be applied in different contexts, right Sanjeev? Is that, that's the yes, question. Yes. Uh, the second yes. question is related to the share, that, the, the slide uh, 20 that's being shared, that uh, there are 30 uh, sub indicators uh, that's shown. So the question of Sanjeev is, is how are, how is uh, Saurabh is going to uh, integrate them uh, into one indicator? Is it correct? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. okay. So that's the question. So please, Saurabh. Yeah, thank you, Sanjeev, for your question. Uh, first question is, uh, yes, we can use it uh, in global perspective also, in national perspective also, in provincial level also, and in uh, city level also. Only uh, maybe we have to be concerned on the indicators. So indicators can be changed any times, but it should reflect within these four dimensions and the four components that we discussed earlier in the governance. So for now, with this 30 indicator also, uh, we, uh, we can use it on global perspective or any perspective. Only the limitation of this framework is like uh, groundwater somewhere is on self-governance uh, stage also. So we are talking about multi-level governance uh, for different level of governance, but somewhere there is no rule, there is no legal framework, but also there is governance going on. So for self-governance, yeah, this framework should be modified and this is kept at the limitation of this framework. 
but for other as you said for global perspective and for true local perspective this framework can be utilized easily and also this can be utilized on the transboundary aquifers also uh, yeah some indicators may be updated or modified uh, we apply on this level but overall the framework remains the same uh, regarding the value of indicators so we plan to conduct a uh, exports questionnaire survey so here i am based on this question uh, these indicators of questionnaire will be developed for the exports who are uh, directly involved um, in groundwater resource governance and management from national level to the local level including the researchers uh, and the academicians who works on the groundwater so these questionnaires will be sent to them and we will get different values for them and once we get the different values for the immediate plan is to take the average but uh, looking at the results maybe we have to follow some statistical statistical analysis to take uh, to aggregate these two values into one but for now the immediate answer would be the mean thank you sanjeev yes uh, sora bhai uh, like do you think that like you should take the questionnaire uh, for like uh, users also so i think that like uh, if you take uh, questionnaires of only those exports so and uh, i think there will be some change if you do can do questionnaires of you know, like some users also yeah so for example yeah. like uh, yeah. if there is some organization who is supplying the ground waters uh, in particular city so uh, what their perspective will be is like they told that uh, we have provided uh, sufficient waters but what people think will be like no they haven't provided so i think there will be some change if you can include uh, the users as well okay um, maybe i didn't answer properly the the users we mentioned is even the private sectors so who are the suppliers and not only the big suppliers it could be the groundwater users associations also yeah we cannot go to the individual level uh, using this framework for now because they may not know either these frameworks or these these provisions are available or not but obviously uh actors or uh, obvious actors means those who are directly involved maybe uh, that doesn't make the size it's not only national level or it's not only government on th those are not only the experts those who are working on the field are experts so as you said uh, the groundwater users associations or groundwater uh, organize um, uh, committee management organization they will be one of the uh, expert to uh, answer this question thank you so much thank you Okay, uh, thank you, Saurav. So we have one question uh, from the chat box uh, raised by Mr. Ranjan Kumar. So my question to Saurav is, what are some major issues affecting groundwater today in rural areas? So one of the major issues, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ranjan Kumar. And uh, one of them, there are, could be many issues and it could be contextual issues. Uh, so I, I'm not sure uh, which area we are talking about, but generally groundwater is a common pool resource so uh, let us take a bucket of water is a groundwater so the bucket can be on urban water urban area and the bucket could be on the uh, half part of the bucket could be on the rural area so uh, due to this rapidly urbanizing area so uh, so rapid urbanization means rapid economic development so uh, due to which the water is one of the basic need uh, for this development so if uh, if one side of the bucket we are emptying then the other side will be also uh emptying so due to this the water level on the rural area is going down uh, also there are some land subsidence issues in coastal areas there are some uh, salt water intrusion or saline water is being mixed with the fresh water so these issues um, are the general issues uh, due to uh, rapid urban city on the uh, rural areas and uh, um, uh, including this climate change has also played some role so due to which uh, the um, the rainfall is not frequent Uh, uh and due to urbanizing area the groundwater recharge is not adequate so that um, uh, because in the urban area uh, the runoff is more than the recharge uh, and uh, the recharge for overall uh, aquifer uh, becomes uh, less uh, which will directly affect on the rural area if i have answered your answer correct then if not then please ask me again thank you sarav thank you dr lok uh, okay so um I think we we have a timekeeper which is Mr. Suwas over here. But <laughs> uh, any we have any uh, questions from uh, participants? We still have one, one time uh, one question from uh, from the participants. I think uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm I just read for uh, Sarah. This is one suggestion. In terms of groundwater management, the framework should be applied to regional scale. 
at least province irrigation area project because it is relevant to current state of management. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tuan. Okay, so uh, we have time for one more question from the participants. Hello. Okay, please. Can I, can I ask one question? Yes, sir. please, Mr. Russell. Um, uh, congratulations to Saurabh for a nice presentation. It's very informative. I enjoyed the presentation. So I was just wondering uh, whether the uh, accountability issue uh, when we talk about the governance has been addressed in the co components of the framework you have been discussing. Yeah. So where do these uh, uh, accountability issues comes in in your framework? So that's what I was wondering. Does, for example, like the, um, are there any um, components that addresses the uh, issues like complaints by public cases filed in the court? Uh, are there these kind of issues addressed when we talk about accountability uh, to measure the good governance of any system? Okay. Thank you, Robin, uh, for your question. So regarding uh, accountability, we have few indicators, like if you can see indicator number 15 uh, for now. Uh, so who is the major uh, groundwater resource guardian uh, for this? So. Uh, uh, and so this, these things are mentioned here. Other thing um, are also uh, on the um, uh, legal framework. So are there any uh, agreements and commitments for the cooperation and coordination and other things? And regarding the publications, so we mentioned on the it's as information and knowledge. So uh, these are like for now we mentioned on uh, VNM group specific publication, but this accountability uh, things can be kept on two dimension for now. One is legal and um, institutional dimension, and other is this. Uh, how this information could, could be shared uh, among multiple stakeholders. So did I answer uh, you or? Yeah, so yeah, I, I'm still, you know, the struggling to, to hammer out whether this is uh, a complete picture or not. But, uh, you know, if, even if there are legal frameworks, uh, that, that, that doesn't function at times because of, you know, the different regions. Uh, and then people are not, you know, the, uh, having you know sufficient you know the, the services or the groundwater system might be not functioning well and then so how can we ensure that if the 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 guardian you are talking about the government for example is not uh, you know the uh, working property is not you know the uh, providing services uh, uh, to the extent that has to be okay um, maybe uh, from this indicator or this dimension or this uh, framework point of view, we are just looking what is the current state. And uh, here we are doing two things. Um, one is what is the provision that we are talking about? And next is what is the capacity also we are accessing in terms of capacity also. So each provision, each, each indicator, what is the provision for that indicator? And uh, what is the institutional capacity? So the basic thing we can know from this institutional capacity, are they educated or not? And regarding functioning of this indicator, yeah, separately some other study could be done, but here we are just measuring what is the current state of groundwater governance and how uh, we can improve uh, this current state um, uh, um, based on this dimensional perspective. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Rosbin. Okay, so we have one more question and then we can wrap up this. Uh... For seminar. So what is the most limitation for several indicators? If that limitation will affect the calculation of CG, GGI, right? GGI, and uh, what would be your approach? So, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear about the question, but uh, currently the whole framework, uh, I said the limitation of the framework is uh, we can access the multi-level governance of this framework, uh, but uh, yeah, self-governance uh, indicators are not here. And uh, self governance is uh, measuring the self governance is one of the limitation of this entire framework. So other limitation could be uh, the acquisition of uh, data from uh, the uh, uh, expert survey. So uh, the major challenge I, for more than limitation, I would mention it as a challenge. So uh, the it would be a challenge or uh, it would be somehow challenge to uh, the expert uh, to um, contextualize or understand uh, this questionnaire. So uh, my plan on this is. Uh, one, we will send the detailed framework uh, so that it defines every 
uh, indicator in detail that we have already developed. And uh, maybe um, language could be uh, one of the um, uh, barrier on that. And once, uh, if we're doing it on Thailand, if we can make it uh, on Thai language, then uh, I think uh, we can get uh, data or we can get this information more easily. Thank you, Saurabh. So, uh, uh, excuse me, can I can I add to that question? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, in terms of that question that was asked, I also wanted to know, like, do you have any, any measures, you know, to identify whether like these indicators that you have provided, 30 indicators, are they independent of each other or not? I mean, if they are interrelated, then I think your dimensions would be biased because like two of the indicators would be reflecting the same results. So maybe that would create some biases. So my suggestion would be if you could address uh, whether these indicators are independent or not, then definitely I think this limitation that was asked would be uh, I think solved or addressed. Yeah, thank you, Kosal, for your suggestion. And for now, uh, uh, there are not so much biased uh, uh, indicators uh, among these 30 indicators because this has been selected uh, from uh, different uh, research work that has been already been done. Uh, only we accumulated from different uh, works and then we aggregated this as a whole framework. But still, um, when sending this question, uh, it, it, we should be clear that either they are uh, uh, interconnected with other indicators or not, so that uh, there's no bias within this dimension. So thank you, thank you, Kosal, for your suggestion also. Uh, okay, so I think uh, all in all, like, we have to wrap up this session. And uh, in the, I mean, like, if you have any questions, please divert the questions directly to me or Mr. Saurabh, uh, Saurabh for clarifications. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Saurabh, for very informative presentations. So uh, thank you. Oh. Okay. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Everyone, uh, although it's not edible, but I think we should give it applause. Uh, like you, Joe, and <laughs> you, and uh, uh, clap for is uh, yeah, yes, that also be very <laughs> appreciated. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay, so uh, first I would like to express my sincere appreciation for 55 uh, participants today, uh, which was really surprised the uh, attentiveness and then also lots of um, available questions that I believe that Mr. Sarah also was able to adjust that and improve uh, his presentations. Um, so before uh, I wrap up uh, this section, I would like to share with you uh, the upcoming plan. Um, Okay, so um, as communicated earlier, uh, we already uh, created this tentative schedule. So our next seminar will be held at exactly the same time from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, will be uh, likely will be virtual as well due to the uh, situation. Will be 12th of May, and the next presenter will be uh, Miss uh, Pia Monai. And then also another, the second presenter will be Ms. Shakti, uh, who is a uh, senior master student and uh, doctoral student. So uh, yeah, so uh, please uh, look out for very insightful and exciting presentations from these two. So uh, thank you everyone. So we wrap up this one. Thank you everyone. Okay, so I think we can.